Hello, welcome to lecture two on Plato's Theotetus. Uh, we're going to be doing things this way um, for the foreseeable sh future with some video and some slides added after the fact. Welcome. Pleased to meet you. If you've never seen me before, this is what I look like. Uh, this is my physical embodiment currently anyway. So we have a lot to get to, so I might as well just get right to it. So in the first lecture, I spent some time going through the reconstructed chronology of Plato's philosophical and literary output, meaning I went through a discussion of the rough order in which scholars think that Plato wrote his dialogues. And I tried in the first lecture to stress that we care about this for philosophical reasons, okay? So it isn't just, for most of us, a matter of trivia or merely academic interest, we might say, uh, in a non-academic context. It is, in fact, philosophically significant to believe certain things or can be philosophically significant about the order in which Plato wrote his dialogues. The reason it's philosophically significant, in a nutshell, has to do with the three periods into which we divide Plato's literary output. This division into three periods is widespread enough that you find here at UCLA a class being taught in Plato's late dialogues and classes also being offered in Plato's early dialogues. This is presumably influenced by this division that I went through during the first lecture. And the reason it makes sense to divide the teaching, studying, writing about Plato in this way is because there are philosophical, thematic, methodological similarities between work that is produced within what we consider to be roughly the same period. So just to give the brief recapitulation of what these three periods look like, we have the early Socratic dialogues, we have the middle constructive dialogues, and we have the late critical dialogues. And remember, this dialogue that we're looking at, Theotetus, is a late dialogue. The early dialogues, recall, are called Socratic because we assume that Plato there is trying to give us something a bit closer to a historical reconstruction of the Socrates that he knew and loved, the living, breathing individual who walked the streets of Athens in the 6th century BC. So. In those dialogues, we have a Socrates character who we assume gives us philosophical positions that were espoused by the actual historical Socrates. Okay. I won't go into the evidence for this claim that we have. It's safe to say, I think, that we're on good ground when we assume that that Socrates in those dialogues is something like the historical Socrates. The middle period is often called constructive because in that period, Plato constructs the grand theories for which he is best known. Okay, When you ask people about Plato, if they know anything, they're going to say something about the theory of forms. That is constructed in works like The Republic and The Phaedo, these are two important middle period dialogues. Okay. In this period, the constructive period, Plato uses his Socrates character that he initially introduced in the early dialogues as an attempt at historical accuracy. He uses that character more as a mouthpiece for his own 
interests, positions, etc. Okay. So that Socrates in the Middle Dialogues speaks a lot about matters of metaphysical and epistemological significance that transcend what we have good reason to think the historical Socrates was focused on. The historical Socrates was focused on ethics, on how you should live your life, what the character virtues are, things like courage, things like wisdom, that enable you to live your life properly. And that's pretty much it. Okay. Plato, in all three periods, is always interested principally in the question of how we should live our lives. In the middle dialogues and the late dialogues, he has an expanding view of what kinds of knowledge in particular we need in order to do that. Okay, and that's one of the things that we're going to talk about today when we look at the section of the dialogue we're covering. Okay, and we're going to cover today only up until the first definition of knowledge that's given by Theodetus. Okay, so it's only a few pages. So we have the middle dialogues in which Plato starts using his Socrates character to address a broader range of philosophical issues. And one way to put the point is to say that Plato does this because for Plato, the domain that you must have some mastery of, that you must have control over, awareness of, that you must know the truth about, in order to live your life well, expands to include more things that the historical Socrates didn't seem to be particularly interested in, or didn't seem to think had a lot of bearing on the central question of how we live our lives. The middle period, constructive theories. That's the association you should have. Now, the late period, which is often called critical, is a period where Plato reflects on many of the theories, especially the theory of forms, that he has developed in the middle dialogues and is willing to subject them to a fair deal of criticism. In the first lecture, I suggested that I don't think that this willingness to criticize shows anything like a crisis of faith in Plato. So the fact that Plato is willing to entertain and write at length these wonderful objections to his theory of forms, you might think that's an indication that he's struggling. I think quite the opposite. I think that Plato is so convinced by his late period that we need to have forms in order for there to be things that are central to human life, things like value, objective value, we might say, things like meaning, that he is willing to be critical of the theory of forms because the theory of forms has become more or less unsinkable, I think, for Plato. I think he's so committed to the fundamental truth of something like the theory he has worked out that he can freely entertain objections to it without feeling threatened. This is the late critical period. Okay. Now, the Theotetus is in this late critical period. I stressed last time that although it is in this late critical period, it isn't a dialogue that goes into a discussion of the theory of forms. We don't see this at all in this dialogue. It's conspicuously absent. Therefore, we also don't find any kind of criticism of the theory of forms. One of the big reasons for going through the division of Plato's dialogues into three periods in the way that I did in the first lecture 
and am reiterating now, is that, in fact, the Theotetus is a quite strange beast. It is a late dialogue that, very self-consciously on Plato's part, adopts many of the themes, methods, approaches that are found in the late, sorry, in the early Socratic dialogues. Okay, so one way to think about the Theotetus is that Plato, in his critical period, decides that there's something to be gained in writing something that looks a lot more like an early Socratic dialogue. Plato decides that there's something to be gained by replacing the Socrates character he has developed in the middle dialogues, who, remember, mostly gives us Plato's views, in replacing that Socrates with something closer to the attempt at capturing a historical figure that we see in the early Socratic dialogues. Okay, So the late dialogues typically feature criticisms of the theory of forms, and they continue with the kind of Socrates character that we get in the middle dialogues. That character I mentioned last time in some dialogues recedes in importance quite a bit. In this dialogue, the Theotetus, we find something quite unique in that Plato tries to go back to something like the first period Socrates. What I mean by that is that we get once again a Socrates who avows ignorance, who claims not to know about the things he is discussing. We also get, as I mentioned very, very recently, a Socrates who doesn't talk about the Platonic forms. We also get a dialogue that ends in aporia. Remember, aporia is what we call it when you can't solve a problem. We get a dialogue where Socrates gets an interlocutor to formulate a definition of a key term and then tries to test that definition. And ultimately, the test is failed and the definition doesn't succeed. These are all features of early Socratic dialogues, but they are coming to us in a work which is almost certainly part of the late period. There are some real questions as to why Plato would want to do this. These questions will occupy us for the remainder of this course to some extent. What is important now in today's lecture is to look at the introduction to see some hints of this, but also to look at the introduction before we get the definition with an aim to establishing what it is that Plato is hoping to accomplish. What I mean by that is that there is in this dialogue, once again, a search for definitions. Plato gives us some stage directions, some hints, in this little bit we're going to be looking at today, that help us establish what his Socrates character is looking for. Okay? We know that his Socrates character wants a definition. Plato gives us some pointers as to what one of those might look like, okay? So let's dive in and look, first of all, at the section of the dialogue that starts from 142a and goes from 143 uh, to 143d. This section of the dialogue is often called a frame. The reason it's called a frame is that it contains two characters, Eucleides and Terpsian, who don't appear in the rest of the dialogue. And these two characters are speaking in 369 BC, which is not the time period 
in which the main action of the dialogue takes place. This is a frame because it's not the main picture. Right? The main picture is the dialogue that includes Socrates, Theotetus, and also Theodorus. This frame doesn't contain any of those characters. It's here to introduce the main picture dialogue. It's a frame. It's very strange to find this frame. And its presence here raises some interesting questions. Why is it here? What does Plato hope to accomplish with it? What's the message here? Is there something we're supposed to be seeing? Yes, there are a few things. So one thing that scholars have pointed to when they discuss this frame, which I think is important, but I don't think is as philosophically important as many other things that are going on here, uh, is that this frame functions in some ways to eulogize Theotetus. Right? So at the beginning, we find two characters. One of them has just seen Theotetus. Theotetus has been injured in battle, now is ill, and Theotetus looks like he might not make it. The two characters are praising Theotetus quite a bit. So this praise functions as a way for Socrates, sorry, for Plato, uh, to pay tribute to a figure that he clearly has some respect for. So that's one thing that this frame is doing. Okay? It allows Plato to write almost a kind of dedication to someone he respected. There are more things going on here, though that I'm not sure are talked about. Uh, I'm not as abreast of this literature uh, as perhaps I should be, uh, but I haven't noticed these things being thematized often. The first thing that this introductory frame accomplishes is that it alerts us to the fact that what we're getting in this dialogue is going to be something closer to the Socrates of the Socratic dialogues. Something closer to a picture of Socrates as he actually was when he was alive. It does this by having the characters in the frame reminisce about Socrates in addition to Theotetus. And having one of the two characters mention that he has written down a long time ago a dialogue that took place between Socrates and Theotetus. This written down dialogue is supposed to come three decades before this frame takes place. So we're talking about 399 BC now. Remember, when we're talking about BCE dates or BC dates, the numbering goes backwards, right? So 369 is after 399. So 399 is when this definition, sorry, when this discussion is supposed to take place. That's also the year uh, Socrates is executed. So the first thing, or sorry, the second thing, but I think the first really important thing that this frame does is allows Plato to tell us something about his intentions in presenting Socrates here. He's suggesting here that we're going to get a Socrates that maybe we haven't seen in a while in the Platonic dialogues. Okay, Because remember, Plato starts off representing Socrates in a way that seems more accurate. Then he takes a lot of liberty with his Socrates character and starts giving that Socrates character all kinds of views that the historical Socrates didn't hold. It's almost like he wants to wipe the slate clean of that middle period Socrates at the outset of this dialogue and give us a hint that what he's going to be talking about in this dialogue, what he's presenting to us, is not that middle period Socrates. Okay, so 
we get this reference to an earlier discussion that is, I think, pretty clearly meant to put on pause the Socrates character and bring us back in our minds to the kind of Socrates character that we find in the early dialogues. That's the first thing that this frame, I think, is meant to do. There's a second thing that, if you look at this frame, it clearly accomplishes. And this same thing is accomplished by several other things that happen before the main action. The second thing, which I think is in its own way as important as the first thing I discussed, or just discussed, the second thing, the first one that I think is truly important philosophically, uh, the second thing has to do with getting us thinking about the way that we use our minds in daily life, okay? Getting us to focus on cognitive activity as such, okay? By cognitive activity, I mean things like remembering. I mean things like forgetting. I mean things like looking for somebody or something. I mean things like having one memory and being reminded of another memory. These are the kinds of activities that I'm talking about. You will notice as we go through, and I will draw our attention to this, there are many, many instances of cognitive activity in this dialogue. So let's look at the very first couple of interchanges between uh, Eucleides and Terpsian here to point out what I mean. Eucleides says, are you only just in from the country, Terpsian, or have you been here for some time? Terpsian responds, I've been here a good while. In fact, I've been looking for you in the marketplace and wondering that I couldn't find you. This might seem like it's a totally innocuous reference. He's just telling him what he's been doing. What has he been doing? Well, he's been looking for him. In isolation, this would seem to be, it's just there. I mean, people look for other people. What's the big deal? You will notice, though, as we go through this, that there is an astonishing number of references to cognitive activities like this. And I think that it can be easy to miss this because it's very subtle. But once you see it, I think it's difficult to not see the artistry at work here on Plato's part. So, Terpsian's been looking for Eucleides. That's the first cognitive activity. What does that involve? Well, on a sort of prima facie intuitive understanding, if I'm looking for somebody, I have a memory of the person I'm looking for. I'm seeing individuals in my environment. And it seems to me like I'm comparing the individuals I see to my memory image, okay, and seeing if any of them match. This is a kind of explanation we're going to see in the main dialogue for how false belief occurs, okay? So it's not just that there are lots of references to individuals performing cognitive activities in this introduction. There certainly are. It's also, as I will point out, that many of those references actually connect with things that are said later in very strong ways. Okay, So that's just the first of these references to cognitive activity. You have someone who's looking for someone, can't find them. Then we have a reference to Theotetus who has been injured in a battle. He is now sick. And Eucleides then goes on to talk about Socrates. And the first thing he says about Socrates is that Socrates is a remarkably good prophet. And why is that? Because Socrates saw Theotetus at a young age, and based on what he saw, Socrates was able to predict that Theotetus would amount to something. 
that Theotetus was gifted, that Theotetus had a kind of mind that would enable him to accomplish things, and a kind of soul that would enable him to accomplish things. Okay. So Socrates is called a prophet for this reason. This is interesting because in the first part of the dialogue, we will get a discussion of the fact that knowledge, whatever it is, seems to enable individuals who have it to make successful, reliable predictions about the future. Okay. That observation about a link between knowledge and prediction comes in an attempt to refute the idea that man is the measure of all things, which in this dialogue means something like, everybody has their own private reality, and what's true for me is true for me, and what's true for you is true for you. And really, we're all kind of right, and that's all we can say. Okay, And Socrates brings up the fact that some people and not others can accurately predict what the future is going to look like as a kind of decisive knockdown of this position, this relativist position. And this is really one of the absolute best things about this dialogue right now in history, uh, I think, is that it contains decisive refutations of relativism, as decisive as you're ever going to find. Um, and they stand up now uh, very well. So to get back to this example that I started out talking about, Socrates here is called a prophet. We know that really what Socrates did when he saw Theotetus and predicted reliably and accurately that Theotetus might amount to something, that it's not really a prophecy. Because a prophecy implies something mystical, something above and beyond what naturally occurs in human life. What Socrates did was look at an individual, watch that individual perform in a certain sense, and make predictions on the basis of that. Okay. That's not prophecy. The fact that it's called prophecy here, I think, has a significance that goes beyond the sort of normal implication in the early Socratic dialogues that Socrates has certain divine sensitivities. Okay. I think in this dialogue, it's doing more than just indicating that you know Socrates had this divine sign that warned him what he should do or shouldn't do that Socrates had a certain kind of religious faith. I think here, what it's meant to do is indicate that unless we have a good reconstruction of what's happening in someone's mind when they make this kind of prediction, it can come to look a lot like prophecy. And I think if you adopt the relativist position that is discussed in the first part of this dialogue, one of the upshots of adopting that position is that prediction comes to look a lot like prophecy, because it's mysterious. Because if there really is no knowledge, if nobody is in a better position cognitively with respect to the truth than anybody else, then the fact that we can do, that we can perform these kinds of accurate predictions or some of us can, looks very mysterious. Okay, So to pull back, the main thing I'm trying to say here is that once again, we have a reference to a cognitive activity. Socrates predicting what's going to happen in the future. And this cognitive activity, again, is a cognitive activity that connects very closely to a discussion that is made a principal theme in the first part of the dialogue. Okay. 
Continuing, we then get a reference to a discussion that Socrates had with Theotetus, a discussion that we learn Eucleides has written down. Okay. Eucleides says that he's written down the dialogue, or that he remembers the dialogue, he knows about it. Terpsian says, could you tell me this discussion? Eucleides responds, good lord, no, not from memory anyway, but I made some notes of it at the time, as soon as I got home. Then afterwards I recalled it at my leisure and wrote it out. And whenever I went to Athens, I used to ask Socrates about the points I couldn't remember and correct my version when I got home. The result is that I have got pretty well the whole discussion in writing. So here we have another reference to a cognitive activity. First of all, Eucleides is remembering what Socrates told him on the first occasion, walking home, keeping it in his mind, I'm guessing, the whole time, keeping it fresh, getting home, writing down from memory the discussion. That is a cognitive activity. That's a use of a mind. Rather than rest content with the first pass draft he has of the conversation that Socrates reports to him, Eucleides decides that he's going to revise. He's going to, when he gets to go to Athens, speak to Socrates again about this conversation, make some changes to what his first draft contains. Now, this idea of writing in this way is interesting because if you think about what is really being done, it's almost like we are, by writing, taking one of our cognitive capacities and externalizing it to a certain extent, right? If I write something down, it's because I don't trust that whatever image I have of that thing in my memory, I don't trust that that's going to be long-lasting, robust, and unchanged, right? So when you write something down, like, Eucleides does here, you're doing that because you've got it in your memory, but you know that your memory is going to decay over time, it's going to change, and that what you remember will experience both alteration and loss. Okay, so he's writing this down. This idea that memory is something like a record, a stamp, an image. Okay, This is something, again, that comes up in this dialogue a lot. So I think, again, here we have a reference to, in this sense of writing, it's almost like we're externalizing what would normally happen in the mind of an individual. It's almost like you write something down when you remember it, and then you have that there. Now you're just doing it onto a scroll or a piece of paper. So, first of all, we get, again, a reference to another cognitive activity. We also get this process of revision, right, which requires a lot of work. And the work that it requires in the external world, going back to Athens, asking Socrates questions, going back home, fixing things, comparing what Socrates just told you to what you have, fixing it. This, again, looks like an external representation of something that you might think goes on in our minds when we go through our memories, compare them to things we've just learned, and try to revise them. Okay, So we get here a cognitive activity that I feel like basically takes place in reality. It's acted out in a certain way, you could say. There are all kinds of interesting questions that are raised by what is described. One thing that I think when I see this is I wonder whether what Eucleides did gave him a more accurate representation of what was actually said or not. Because 
it's intuitively obvious, I think, something that, if you think about it, should be clear to you. But also now, uh, there's some empirical evidence for this. The fact that we often change our memories when we go back to them. And that when we remember, a lot of times, we are engaging in reconstruction as much as we are in reconsulting. Right? So what I'm getting at here is maybe it would have been better if Eucleides had simply heard the conversation account from Socrates the first time, wrote it down, and left it. Because when he goes back to Socrates and asks further questions, it's possible that Socrates might remember things differently. Socrates might amplify the memories, might expand the memories, might add to the memories. Socrates is going to have a different interpretation of what was said, minimally. He's going to ascribe different meanings to some of the interchanges that were had. That might influence how he describes what happened. Okay. Now, I get into this question, which is a speculative one, of would it have been better for Eucleides to simply leave the first draft? I get into this because I have a belief that Plato is trying to tell us something about his own literary method, at least in the early Socratic dialogue. What I mean is that what Eucleides is describing here looks to me like what Plato probably did do when writing some of the dialogues, okay, the early Socratic dialogues, because I'm assuming that Plato was not present at all of the conversations he purports to be reporting in these early Socratic dialogues. I shouldn't say that he purports to be doing it, right? He doesn't come out and say, here's some things that definitely actually happen. But he does present things in, in a way that give the strong suggestion that there's something going he, on here that's accurate in the early dialogues. If you ask yourself, well, how did Plato actually come to write these dialogues? Especially in cases where he wasn't present in the initial conversation. Well, one really strong candidate answer, which I think is far and away the most plausible, is that he spoke to Socrates. Socrates related to him the details of the conversations he had. Plato wrote those things down. Maybe Plato asked further questions. Maybe Plato could ask Socrates, well, what would you have said in this situation? Right? If Plato needed to add things, could have consulted Socrates. Given that Plato's reflection on his own literary process is something that you don't find, if this is really part of what's going on here, it's quite incredible. I mean, I suppose you might think it's also not incredible because how else are you going to write an early Socratic dialogue? What I mean when I say it's incredible is that if this is part of what Plato's trying to do here, it shows a level of conscious awareness in Plato of the fact that he is an author with an audience, that audience has expectations, that audience has read some of his other work, and so on, that I think in this time period is incredible for someone to have. Because if you read a lot of the pre-Socratics, many of them don't write in a way that suggests an awareness that there's going to be an audience. There wasn't an audience in quite the same sense, meaning there wasn't necessarily an expectation that you had certain readers who would have read some of your earlier works. Plato here seems to show an awareness that people are reading his things and almost seems to be giving us a meta picture about how he, Plato, operated in the early dialogues. That, I think, is something speculative. But if you look at the next bit, where Eucleides describes this technical point 
about how he constructed the dialogue. I think this gives us reason to think maybe this is part of Plato's intention in including this. Eucleides says, this is the book, Terpsian. You see, I have written it out like this. I have not made Socrates relate the conversation as he related it to me, but I represent him as speaking directly to the persons with whom he said he had this conversation. These were, he told me, Theodorus the Geometer and Theotetus. I wanted in the written version to avoid the bother of having the bits of narrative in between the speeches. I mean, when Socrates, whenever he mentions his own part in the discussion, says, and I maintain, or I said, or of the person answering, he agreed, or he would not admit this. That is why I have made him talk directly to them and have left out this formula. So this is a, an odd thing for Plato to be talking about. There's another dialogue I mentioned that's a late dialogue, the Parmenides, that is a report of a report. So it's even one step removed, a report of a report of a report, in fact. In that case, there is this awkwardness of including the additional stages in places. Here, Socrates is trying to tell us, or not Socrates, Plato's trying to tell us through his characters that this is not going to happen here. But I do think that there isn't much reason to tell us this unless there's a biographical point that Plato's trying to make about his own method. Maybe not. Anyway, to conclude then and sum up what I wanted to say about the introduction, main thing that happens here for our purposes, I mentioned in the beginning that there is a eulogy of a certain sort for Theodetus. That's significant. I think it's the least interesting thing. For our purposes, the most interesting thing, in order of certainty, are, first of all, this frame enables Plato to put on pause the middle period Socrates he has been developing. If he has an audience that has been following his work, this audience will know that there is a Socrates character now who says things that are not things that the historical Socrates would have said. The first function of this frame, the most important and the most certain function, is that it serves to put that Socrates on ice, tells us that we're going to get something closer to the historical Socrates. It's not going to be identical because the historical Socrates, as I mentioned when talking about the middle period stuff, isn't a figure that appears to be interested in what is called knowledge in this dialogue. Knowledge in this dialogue refers to something that transcends wisdom, where wisdom is a kind of cognitive epistemic awareness that is very, very closely tied to what we normally think of as ethical situations and values. This Socrates in this dialogue is interested in knowledge, which is broader, includes more things. And the historical Socrates didn't seem to have been interested. So there's one way in which this is still not the historical Socrates, but this Socrates has features of that Socrates. That's the first function of this introduction, to clue us in that something's going to go on in that respect. Second function of this introduction is that it enables Plato to make reference to a number of cognitive activities that he will analyze in great detail later on in the dialogue. Acts of memory, acts of uh, searching, acts of having an image or a memory and being prompted to remember something further. This happened when Eucleides saw Theotetus and then was instantly reminded of Socrates. Right? This is a case of seeing a visual image and then having a memory in your mind triggered because it's somehow associated with that visual image. This can also happen between one memory and another. Okay. This is another cognitive act. I didn't flag it the first time through. 
So the second function here is to get into our minds some sense of the prevalence of these cognitive activities, also some sense of the mysteriousness of them. That's why we get the reference to prophecy I've suggested. The third thing that this is doing, perhaps, and this is more speculative, is giving us some kind of clue as to the way that Plato worked when constructing the early Socratic dialogues. Okay, so to turn now to the picture in the frame, the main dialogue. This dialogue starts with Socrates telling Theodorus that he is interested in a particular question, the question being, are there any young men that you currently are teaching in philosophy or geometry? Geometry is what Theodorus does. Or are there any young men that you're aware of who are studying these subjects? Socrates goes on to indicate that he has a strong interest in figuring out which young people have intellectual talents and that his interest in figuring this out is part of a more general interest in the health of particular societies. Socrates wants to know whether people are doing philosophy because to him that indicates that their society is healthy, that it contains healthy individuals who are concerned about the things that they ought to be concerned about. So Socrates starts out asking this question. Theodorus answers quickly, yes, there is one person, this young man, Theotetus, who's about 16 years old. He then tells Socrates two things about Theotetus. The first of them is that Theotetus, physically speaking, he thinks bears a strong resemblance to Socrates. Socrates famously uh, is said to be snub-nosed, described as fairly unattractive very often. Here we get a reference. Theodorus is telling us that Socrates and Theotetus are similar looking. Okay, That's the first thing. The second thing that we learn about Theotetus is that he has a tremendous number of intellectual virtues, meaning he has what we might call cognitive versions of the kinds of character virtues that Socrates is interested in in the early dialogues and that Plato is always interested in as well. In the early dialogues, the virtues are things like courage, things like self-control. These are states and dispositions that we might have in us that will enable us to successfully navigate instances in life when we are called upon to act in a certain way or not act in a certain way. And if you're courageous, that helps you navigate situations in life that you will face. Here in the discussion of Theotetus, we get reference to a number of cognitive or epistemic virtues, meaning these are states that a person might have in themselves, in their soul, that are like the character virtues in many respects. They're different, though, because now the application is not in outward behavior, but in thought. Okay, So we get this list of intellectual virtues that Theotetus possesses. Along with a quickness beyond the capacity of most people, he has an unusually gentle temper. And to crown it all, he is as manly a boy as any of his fellows. That is a discussion of character virtues. Manly here is like courageous, word for courageous. I never thought such a combination could exist. I don't see it arising elsewhere. Now we get more references to things that are more specifically intellectual virtues. People as acute and keen and retentive as he is are apt to be very unbalanced. So he's acute. He sees things very, very clearly, very, very quickly. He's uh, keen, meaning he's really, really interested in getting to the truth. 
He has a great enthusiasm. He's also retentive, meaning he remembers things well. Okay, These are all what we might call low, not low level, well, they're virtues of intellect that apply to very, very specific uses of our brains that you could call low level because these are like elemental components of thought processes that we might engage in. So we're looking at very specific things. Acuity. Do you see things well? Are your intuitions strong? When you see, say, a mathematical problem, do you have the intellectual acuity that enables you to see how you would solve it very quickly? That's something that perhaps you're born with, but also, if it's truly a virtue, something that you can develop by habituating yourself. Keenness. Again, this, you can see how this would be very important to uh, later uses of your intellect to actually care about solving problems. Retentive. Can you remember what it is that you have come up with? These are all virtues. Theodorus is pointing out that many people who have these particular virtues to the extent that Theotetus does are also unbalanced. He explains, they get swept along with a rush like ships without ballast. What stands for courage in their makeup is a kind of mad excitement. Now we get a reference to courage, which is interesting because it's clearly meant to be an intellectual virage, sorry, virtue. So something like intellectual courage. He says, what stands for courage in the case of many people who are as acute and keen and retentive as Theotetus is often a kind of mad excitement. Okay, If you've read the Lakeys, which if you were in the class I taught last quarter on ancient Greek philosophy, you would have read, you will see here that this reference to a kind of mad excitement that can easily be confused for courage in some people that's very much pulled from the Lakeys. There's a kind of foolhardiness in the Lakeys that's discussed that can sometimes look like courage, but in fact isn't. Okay? The daredevil who, you know, plays chicken on the road, that can look courageous, but not if the person is a psychopath or simply has no awareness of danger or doesn't care. Here... This is discussed in an intellectual way. There are certain people who have these great virtues, but that these virtues make them lose balance. So they're so keen, they're so excited, they're so quick at getting things that they get swept up in their own enthusiasm. Here we get a reference to the idea that, in fact, that is not a good state to be in. And luckily, Theotetus is not in that state. Okay, So Theotetus isn't the kind of person who has this kind of acuity, this keenness, this retentiveness, and allows that to sweep him up in trains of thought that need to be brought back down to earth. Okay. While on the other hand... The steadier sort of people are apt to come to their studies with minds that are sluggish somehow, freighted with a bad memory. But this boy, Theotetus, approaches his studies in a smooth, sure, effective way, and with great good temper. It reminds one of the quiet flow of a stream of oil. Okay? So here we get almost like two extremes that are often found in the world. You have some people who are very quick, very keen, very quick to identify what is important, very enthusiastic about finding those things, and then able to retain the things that they found. You have many people in the world that are like that, but they are, in a sense, malformed. They're developed in a way where one part of what they need is overdeveloped, and the other part has kind of atrophied, is underdeveloped. So these people on the one hand, are so keen, so enthusiastic, so uh, good at seeing, 
what is necessary and so good at retaining what they've seen that they're almost like runaway trains. Okay. On the other hand, now we get the second group of people. These people aren't like runaway trains at all. The problem with them is that you can't even get them to move. They are trains that it's very difficult to get started because they don't have good memories. They're sluggish. They're not full of energy. They're not good at seeing things. These are two extremes. Theotetus is going through the middle. And he's just right. He's a Goldilocks style uh, epistemic agent. Okay. So there's a suggestion here of a couple important things. First of all, that we can understand virtue, the concept of virtue that's discussed at great length in the early Socratic dialogues. We can apply that to the intellect. And we can ask questions about how we should be, what habits we should have, how we should try to develop ourselves from an epistemic standpoint. Meaning, I'm not just trying to ask how I should be so that I can act properly in the world. I also have something to gain from asking that question that comes from my need to use my mind well. Okay. We also get this interesting suggestion that, in fact, you can go wrong by having only some of these virtues. You can be lopsided. Okay. So they come almost like a unit. This is uh, an interesting observation because if you know much about the early Socratic dialogues, you'll know that one of the big themes there is the so-called unity of virtues, meaning is it possible to have like one of the virtues by itself or two of them without the others? In this description, we get a strong suggestion that the answer is no, at least not when it comes to these virtues, because it's possible to have acuity, which in ordinary cases would be a virtue. But if you don't have the other virtues that counterbalance that acuity, that acuity can actually, it sounds like, be a deficit or a vice in you. Okay, so the answer, can you just have one of these virtues listed here? No, you can't, because if you just had that quality, in isolation, it wouldn't be a virtue. Because if you've done these dialogues, you know one thing about a virtue is that a virtue is always going to help you. It's going to help you perform better. If you just have this keenness or this acuity or this retentiveness without counterbalancing traits, your keenness, your attentiveness, your retentiveness, they are not going to be virtues in your case. Okay, so we get a lot going on already. We also get a praise of Theotetus. Then we get Theodorus not being able to remember something that Socrates asks about, something related to Theotetus. Notice another cognitive activity, attempting to remember. Then Theodorus says, but he, Theotetus, is the middle one of this group coming towards us. He and his companions were greasing themselves outside just now. It looks as if they have finished and are coming in here. But look and see if you recognize him. Okay, look. We get another cognitive activity. Now Theodorus is challenging Socrates. Look and see if you can recognize this person. Another cognitive activity. Socrates says, yes, I know him. So Socrates is successful here. Socrates also is able to connect the memory he has of Theotetus that's now active because he's now been able to look at the person in front of him and match it to something in his memory. He's now activated another memory, which is the memory of whose son this boy is. He's the son of Euphronius of Sunium, very much the kind of person, my friend, that you tell me his son is. Okay, so now we get a couple of additional cognitive activities. And notice structurally that this is in some ways the inverse of what goes on when you're looking for someone. And if you're looking for somebody, as was discussed earlier in this dialogue, you've got an image of who you are looking for in your head. You're comparing that image to individuals that you see and looking for a match. Here, Socrates doesn't have in his sort of active mental space an image of 
Theotetus booted up, so to speak. Doesn't have it ready to go in RAM. Instead, he's trying to look at the world and find something in his memory that matches what he's seeing. Right? So it's the inverse of looking. Here you're looking and hoping to match what you're seeing in the world with your memory. When you're searching, you've got your memory and you're trying to find something in the world that corresponds to that. Okay. I've focused a lot on this cognitive activity thing because I've never seen it discussed. Um, and that may be from ignorance, but I think it's really, when you see it, it's quite incredible uh, that this is going on. Because it's like, not only do you get these cognitive activities coming very, very quickly at you, you also, if you look at them, get very different kinds. Okay, you get one action that looks like it might be best understood as the inverse or opposite of another action. So these are carefully chosen, I would suggest. Now, you can get too carried away with this realization that this is going on, because of course there are other dialogues when one person is said to have to find, you know, one person is asked, hey, see if you can recognize this person. Okay, that happens, because these dialogues are meant to represent something similar to ordinary life, and that happens in ordinary life. There are just so many in this dialogue, in the opening pages, that it's difficult to think that they're merely coincidental. Also, in this dialogue, we get this reference to the fact, if it is a fact, that Socrates and Theotetus resemble each other. Socrates is looking for Theotetus, asked if he can remember. He's also being asked to look for an image that is said to resemble what he looks like. Okay, so he's looking at the world, he's finding something that maybe looks like him. What follows when Theotetus and Socrates start talking is a reference to what Theodorus has said about this physical resemblance. So Socrates initially starts out by saying, Theotetus, Theodorus here told me many things about you. One of the things he told me is that you and I look alike. And Socrates asks him, do you think that we should take uh, Theodorus's word about this? And Socrates makes a kind of argument that I think feels a bit forced. It's always a bit forced in the Platonic dialogues when they get to the discussion of philosophy. Right? It's hard to introduce philosophy into normal life, you might say. Right? Like It's awkward in your life, in many cases, if you're at a birthday party and a child is opening presents, and you start saying, you know, what is it to give a gift? What is a gift? It never feels natural, and most of the time, you're going to be booed, right? Plato has to do this in every dialogue, right? Move from real life to philosophical discussion. It often feels a bit forced. So here, the transition is Socrates starts out, hey, I've heard we look the same. Question... Should we have taken Theodorus's word when he spoke about our physical resemblance? And Socrates goes into a discussion that's very, very the kind of discussion that the Socrates in the early Socratic dialogues uh, would be at home in. He says, if you and I each had a lyre, a guitar-like instrument basically, and Theodorus had told us that they were both similarly tuned, should we have taken his word for it straight away? Or should we have tried to find out if he was speaking with any expert knowledge of music? Theotetus says, oh, we should have inquired into that. Socrates continues, and if we had found that he was a musician, we should have believed what he said. But if we found he had no such qualification, we should have put no faith in him. Theotetus says, yes, that's true. Now, I suppose, if we are interested in this question of our faces being alike, we ought to consider whether he is speaking with any knowledge of drawing or not. Theotetus says, yes, I should think so. Then is Theodorus an artist? No, not so far as I know. Okay, 
Socrates concludes, then if he asserts that there is some physical resemblance between us, whether complimenting us or the reverse, one ought to pay, one ought not to pay much attention to him. Okay. So here we get this discussion of expertise, which is a you know an obsession of the historical Socrates that appears in the early Platonic dialogues. And the upshot is you shouldn't listen to someone when they say something about something, or maybe you should, but you should not take what they say as the gospel truth unless they have the relevant expertise. That's that's the thing that's first introduced here. To me, it feels very awkward here. I'm not sure whether Plato intended this or not, but it seems in principle just wrong to think that people who draw and have training in visual art have any kind of privileged access to facts about who looks like who, right? You know, because obviously we come into this world with an incredible facility to recognize resemblances. At very least, an infant needs to be able to recognize their parents. That's not saying one person looks like another, but I'm guessing that does involve, or one way of looking at it, how this is accomplished, is that there's an image in a memory, and the infant needs to match the parents to that image. You don't need a degree in art to be able to recognize your parent or your spouse. It's just something we can do. The same really goes for the musical example. If you really have two guitars in front of you, and someone plays all the strings individually of both instruments, and you compare them, you don't need musical expertise to be able to recognize that they're in tune or not. Okay? You just hear the two strings plucked. Do they sound the same to you or not? Okay? Now, you can get better at recognizing when things are out of tune or in tune with experience. But really, nothing that you learn by way of theory is going to help you answer the question of whether or not two instruments are tuned the same. It's a skill you develop with practice if it's something that you develop at all. There's something innate to it. It can be developed. The thing I'm trying to say here is you don't get to be better at that by developing expert knowledge of music, per se. Especially if you think, when you hear the words expert knowledge, of a kind of systematized understanding of a domain that starts from some grasp of first principles. Okay? You can know what there is to know about the different modes that Greek music relied on, Aeolian, Dorian, so on. You can also know the kinds of things that the early theoretical discussions of music by individuals like Pythagoras would have went into, things about complicated mathematics that gives you the diatonic series of tones, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, that thing, you know, the early Greek mathematicians were very interested in the fact that you get those tones, but first and foremost, the first thing you get are things like octaves. You get those by subdividing strings that are basically like lines, and you get octaves when you cut the string, you divide it in half and make two strings, and now you pluck those, and they are exactly an octave higher. Okay? So, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, 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 right? Those are an octave. The Greeks were interested in the fact that you can produce those two sounds, do, do, that are in that relationship if you subdivide a single string into two strings, and then you'd have to have an initial undivided string of the same length, 
if you pluck the big one and the small one, which you've created by halving the first one, you're going to get that octave relationship. That could be expert knowledge of music, but you don't need that, first of all, to recognize that an instrument is in tune or out of tune with another one. You also aren't going to be helped by that if you want to answer that question. You tune an instrument with your ears, not with your eyes or with fractions. You know, you don't measure the strings. It's not your first go-to when you're trying to figure out whether an instrument's in tune. So anyway, this is a bit awkward. I'm not sure whether Plato actually believes that this expertise would help you. One option. Another option, Plato believes that Socrates might have believed this. And so this is a bit of almost a parody. Third option, Plato thinks that this is not what's going on and wants us to maybe question it. Okay, I bring this up because last time I talked a fair deal, last lecture, about certain things that can happen in dialogue form that don't happen when we're just reading prose, philosophical prose sentences and essays and paragraphs. One of the things I mentioned that can happen is that an author can present ideas that we are not intended to think of as true, but they are presented so that we reflect on why they are false. Okay, This could be happening here. I don't have a level of certainty to be able to say which of the three options I've just outlined is actually going on here. I would like it to be the second or third one, right? Because the first one involves Plato having a kind of, I think, fairly egregious misunderstanding of how certain cognitive tasks are accomplished. Right? And so it would be certainly look better for Plato if he were doing this to try to show us something rather than tell us something. But maybe that's not the case. One of the things about dialogues, and in particular platonic dialogues, is that sometimes when we are thinking about them and trying to understand them, we are forced to answer questions like this. Like, this looks like a bad argument. Did Plato mean this to be a bad argument? Is there some lesson we're supposed to be learning from this, which isn't the same as just listening to the argument and accepting it or not accepting it? Can a failure that's being displayed teach us something over and above just showing us what to believe? And, you know, Plato wrote in dialogue form. I think he must have done that for a reason. And he must have kept doing it for a reason, even if he started because he was trying to portray Socrates. If he kept it up, that's probably because he thought there was some reason. And I think given everything we know about Plato's interest in method when teaching philosophy, there's good reason to suspect he kept the dialogue form so that he could do things like this, so that he could show us people making mistakes and failing. I'm not sure what's happening here, it's an issue that I wanted to flag right away. Socrates then goes on to talk about souls, and he says, supposing that somebody was praising the soul of one of us, suppose he said one of us was good and wise, oughtn't the one who heard that to be very anxious to examine the object of such praise? And ought the other, oughtn't the other to be very willing to show himself off? So here Socrates is talking about the fact that Theodorus has said that Theotetus is a virtuous person. And Socrates says, if that is something you hear, what you should feel is a strong desire to get to know the person who is alleged to be virtuous. Because we want to know virtue. It's important to have it. It's important to see it so that you can learn how to have it and what it looks like. So Socrates is now getting into a push to have Theotetus demonstrate some of the qualities that Theodorus just described to him. This is something that's very commonly seen 
in the Socratic dialogues where Socrates needs to cajole, coax an individual into having a philosophical conversation. Sometimes in other cases, Socrates is himself coaxed, although Socrates requires very little coaxing, into having a philosophical conversation. Sometimes there are even threats of violence. Like, you have to do this. We're going to hold you here. That happens in the Republic. Um, anyway, this is something that I think uh, is characteristic of the early Socratic dialogues. We see it here. Now, Theotetus takes up the challenge. Socrates starts asking him what it is that he is learning from Theodorus. You are learning some geometry from Theodorus, I expect. Theotetus, yes, I am. And some astronomy and music and arithmetic. Yes, I am. This is a very platonic list of disciplines. I mentioned the relationship between music and geometry and arithmetic, you might call it. I suppose it's more like arithmetic. Astronomy is also closely connected to both of these things. So we have here what we might say are mathematical disciplines and then applications of those disciplines to the real world. Socrates is asking Theotetus what he's studying so as to build to the philosophical question he wants to ask. Socrates says, Although I get on with them pretty well in most ways, he means other people who seem to know things, I have a small difficulty which I think ought to be investigated with your help and that of the rest of the company. Now, isn't it true that to learn is to become wiser about the thing one is learning? That's the first question Socrates asks. So he's asking Theotetus to list the things he's studying, and then he asks him a question about learning. Now, there's a method here as well to what Plato was doing, because if you know about the early Socratic dialogues, you will know that what happens in those dialogues is that Socrates typically finds someone who either alleges a certain kind of knowledge or expertise about a certain subject matter, or is in a position in society, has a reputation, has a function in society, that would indicate that maybe they do or should know something more than most people about a particular topic. Right? So in the Euthyphro, Euthyphro is a priest-like figure. Socrates asks Euthyphro about holiness or piety. This happens in many, many early dialogues. And in the Apology, Socrates kind of constructs this as his own intellectual biology, or sorry, biography. Right? I was told that I know nothing, and so I needed to disprove this claim. I had to understand what that meant. Sorry, I was told I was the wisest. I know that I know nothing. I had to understand this, so what did I do? I went out and asked experts to show me what they know, okay, to try to figure out what the oracle could have meant when the oracle said, uh, you're the wisest person. So we had to test other people who allegedly know. That's what's happening here, right? So Theotetus is being established as a learner. He's currently a student. If he's currently a student, he doesn't know everything there is to know about the things he's learning, right? He wouldn't be a learner if that were the case. But if he does have some insight into something that maybe not everyone has, maybe that would be learning itself, right? So I think that's what's happening here. Uh, Theotetus is being established as someone who might have special insight into learning. And Socrates says, isn't it true that to learn is to become wiser about the thing one is learning? Theotetus says, yes, of course. And what makes men wise, I take it, is wisdom. Theotetus says, yes. Socrates says, and is this in any way different from knowledge? Theotetus says, what? Socrates says, wisdom. Isn't it the things which they know that men are wise about? Well, yes. Socrates, so knowledge and wisdom will be the same thing. Theotetus says, yes. So here we have a little interchange that might be, at first seem like it is pointless and way too finicky, concerned about details that maybe don't matter. I think there's a reason that this is here. Um, David Sedley, uh, in the book The Midwife of Platonism, 
also draws attention to this. The reason that this is here is to introduce the topic of knowledge. Okay. Now, the word for wisdom here is Sophia, where philosophy comes from, right? The love of wisdom, Sophia. The word for knowledge here is episteme, where we get epistemology from. In this bit of the dialogue, there seems to be a concern to establish episteme is, as something that this historical type of Socrates would be naturally found talking about. Okay. To understand why this is something that maybe Plato feels the need to legitimize, you have to understand that Sophia wisdom and episteme are related concepts, but they would have been heard as distinct to many of Plato's readers. Okay. Wisdom, Sophia, is something that more clearly has a practical, ethical upshot. Think about someone like Yoda, right, in Star Wars. Yoda is wise. Yoda, I think, is also knowledgeable. But we call Yoda wise not because we think Yoda is going to be very good at Trivial Pursuit or at biology, per se. Yoda is wise because Yoda seems to know a lot about navigating life. And in fact, Yoda ends up knowing basically the deep metaphysical structure of the universe, right? He knows about the force. He knows about these principles that are at work that basically enable him uh, to do things that look like magic to outsiders. But the point is that whatever cognitive awareness Yoda has, it's wisdom because it has a very clear tie to the practical. Episteme knowledge can certainly be of practical significance, but it also applies to many things that we might be said to be aware of that don't have any obvious direct practical upshot in and of themselves. So, for example, uh, one of the first examples of episteme we get in this dialogue is knowing that you feel cold. The wind is blowing, you feel cold, or you feel warm, or whatever. And that's something you can know. It looks like a proposition. You know that you feel cold, or it is cold. That's not something that has obvious immediate implications for how you should live your life. Now, it does, of course, because if you're cold, you should put on a coat. But... That jump to practical implications requires more additional contextual information. Right? You need to know more about the situation to know how this information is useful. With the kind of cognitive awareness that constitutes wisdom, there's a more direct link to the practical. So in the early Socratic dialogues, there is sometimes a suggestion that virtue itself whatever dispositions allow you to reliably act in the right way, that virtue itself might actually just turn out to be wisdom. And wisdom is basically a knowledge of value. Okay, A knowledge of what it is that's valuable, how valuable it is, what is most valuable, what is least valuable, what has a value that is absolute, that it what is always valuable no matter what, what has a value that's merely conditional or instrumental. Something like money that can sometimes be valuable and sometimes is valueless. Sometimes it can hurt you to have too much money. Wisdom has a clear connection to the practical in a way that knowledge doesn't. Okay, What's going on here is an attempt to move from wisdom to episteme, knowledge. So first, if somebody learns something, they become wiser. What makes men wise, I take it, is wisdom. Yes. Is that in any way different from knowledge? And Theotetus says what, right? Which indicates that this question is supposed to be somewhat strange. 
Socrates says, wisdom, isn't it the things which they know that men are wise about? Well, yes. So knowledge and wisdom will be the same thing. Yes. Now, when Socrates first asks, isn't it true that to learn is to become wiser about the thing one is learning? That is a question that he can expect a yes answer to. Because these terms, although they do have already these kinds of distinct resonances in the minds of listeners and speakers, where wisdom means something a little bit closer to practical knowledge, and knowledge can encompass theoretical things, it can also be the case that wisdom, at least, can appear in contexts like this. Okay, so the early uh, natural philosophers, the first people who really we study when we study the history of philosophy, the pre-Socratics, those people were said to be wise because they did things like predict eclipses. Thales, famously, was able to do this. This was considered to be wisdom. Okay, Now that is clearly a theoretical thing. So there is a use of the word wisdom which applies to non-practical kinds of awareness. Wisdom, if anything, is the wider of the two terms, the broader of the two terms. Here, what we're really trying to establish is that knowledge is something that this historical Socrates uh, would be talking about. And that's being established by, well, look, here are some uses of the two terms where they seem to be more or less identical. This justifies a talk about knowledge. Okay. So knowledge and wisdom will be the same thing. Yeah. So as much as this little bit seems like well, that's pointless it can tell us a lot about the assumptions of the initial readers and the initial participants in this discussion socrates says this is just where my difficulty comes in i can't get a proper grasp of what on earth knowledge really is could we manage to put it into words what do all of you say who will speak first Socrates wants to know what on earth knowledge really is. If you have read any early Socratic dialogues, you will immediately recognize that this is a request for definition. We want to know what it is that knowledge really is. We want to put it into words. We want a formula that enables us to understand what knowledge really is. Socrates famously holds that we can't really know anything about particular concepts until we have a definition that we formulated explicitly in this way. So he's fishing for one of those. Socrates asks Theodorus for his contribution. Theodorus declines. I don't want to get involved in this. As an aside, when I see this, I wonder whether there isn't some sense in which Plato is trying even in this late period, to try to rehabilitate the reputation of Socrates. Because Socrates, remember, if you've read the Apology, he's charged with corrupting the youth, with having these kinds of conversations with the young, corrupting them. Here, it looks like Plato might be trying to suggest, hey, Socrates did try to talk to older people as well. It's just that they didn't, ref you know, they refused. And so... He ended up talking to young people. It wasn't intentional. That might be going on here. Anyway, Socrates asks Theotetus, what do you think knowledge is? Socrates asks Theotetus, says, I think that the things Theodorus teaches are knowledge. I mean geometry and the subjects you enumerated just now. Then again, there are the crafts such as cobbling, whether you take them together or separately. They must be knowledge, surely. Okay, so that's the initial answer. It's an answer to a definitional question that takes the form of a list of examples. What is knowledge? Well, cobbling, that's knowledge, shoemaking. Geometry, that's knowledge. The other things I'm studying with Theodorus, remember the list earlier included astronomy and music and arithmetic. Those things are knowledge. Okay. That's the initial answer. This, if you've read any early Socratic dialogues, is going to very obviously call to mind the kinds of answers we see in those dialogues. These answers are never satisfactory to Socrates. 
Okay, And he's going to reject this one too. He says with irony, that is certainly a frank and indeed a generous answer, my dear lad. Irony because a speaker here is attempting to convey a meaning by speaking that goes beyond the literal content of the words that they're speaking. Right? So this is irony because Socrates is saying something that looks like he's happy with the answer. It's a frank and generous answer. But in fact, he's rejecting it. Why? I asked you for one thing and you have given me many. I wanted something simple and I've got a variety. Theotetus, what does that mean, Socrates? Socrates says, nothing I dare say, but I'll tell you what I think. When you talk about cobbling, you mean just knowledge of the making of shoes? Yes, that's all I mean by it. And when you talk about carpentering, you mean simply the knowledge of the making of wooden furniture? Yes, that's all I mean again. And in both cases, what you are doing is to define what the knowledge is of. Theotetus, yes. Socrates, but that's not what you were asked, Theotetus. You were not asked to say what one may have knowledge of or how many branches of knowledge there are. It was not with any idea of counting these up that the question was asked. We wanted to know what knowledge itself is. Or am I talking nonsense? Theotetus says, no, you are perfectly right. So there are several related points made here that are meant to explain to us why this first answer is not satisfactory. It's not a satisfactory answer to the question that Socrates believes himself to be asking. Okay, The first point is that Socrates wanted one thing. Theotetus has given him many. He wanted a definition of knowledge. Theotetus has given him a list of many things that we have knowledge of. Okay, The presumption here is that since we use the same name, knowledge, to refer to different things in the world, if we're in fact using that word correctly, of at least some of these cases, that needs to be because they share something. There needs to be something that they have in common, which enables us to properly apply the term knowledge to all of them. And what Socrates is suggesting is that he's looking for that thing. Okay, that's what he means when he says he wants one simple thing, not many things. Okay, so the first objection is just, it's very common from the early Socratic dialogues. You ask, uh, sorry, I ask for one thing, you're giving me a, a many. Socrates goes into more detail about what's wrong with this answer, a related point. Socrates says, when you talk about cobbling, you mean just knowledge of the making of shoes. So when you talk about cobbling, isn't the definition of cobbling just making shoes, knowledge of making shoes? Theotetus says, yeah, that's what I mean by cobbling. When you talk about carpentering, another thing on the list, you mean the knowledge of making wooden furniture. Yes. Socrates says, in both cases, what you are doing is to define what the knowledge is of. Right? So here, Socrates' point is related to his first point, slightly different. Here he's kind of giving us what I would call a diagnosis of why it is that Theotetus was able to give him many things when he was asked for one. He was able to give many things because he is actually not answering the initial question. If he were actually to try to answer the initial question, what is knowledge, he would have to identify one thing. Right? He would have to identify the single thing that all of these instances have in common that enable them all to be called knowledge. He's able to give many things because he's not answering the question, what is knowledge? He's answering a different question, which is the question of what it is that we can have knowledge about. Okay. Now, in the early Socratic dialogues and the middle Platonic dialogues, this is something that we could say is a case of trying to tell us what something is like instead of telling us what it is. Okay? In the early Socratic dialogues, there is very often a discussion of the fact that you need to have a definition of what something is before you can know anything for certain concerning what it's like. Okay, So the question 
of what things are their knowledge is an attempt to answer a question about what knowledge is like. Okay? It's not a question about what knowledge is that we're trying to answer. We're answering a question of what it's like, where that means some further feature that follows from what knowledge is. Okay? Maybe follows from what knowledge is along with some further assumptions about the world. But the main point is the question, what kinds of things can we have knowledge of, is going to be for Socrates and Plato, a question that is parasitic on, comes downstream from, the more fundamental question of what knowledge is. Because you can't know for certain what things you can have knowledge of unless you know what knowledge is. This is the way that Socrates and Plato approach these questions. If you don't know what knowledge is, you can't know whether any putative thing that you are said to have knowledge of is actually a proper subject matter for knowledge. Okay, So we want here a question of what knowledge uh, is, not what it's of. That is not what you were asked, Theotetus. You were not asked to say what one may have knowledge of or of how many branches of knowledge there are. It was not with any idea of counting these up that the question was asked. We wanted to know what knowledge itself is. Okay. So the first issue here is that we have an answer to a question that wasn't asked. And the question that's being answered is less important than the question that was asked. Socrates goes on to give us further reasons why the answer given uh, is not satisfactory given the intentions that lay behind the asking of the question. Socrates says, now you think about this. Supposing we were asked about some commonplace everyday thing, for example, what is clay? And supposing we were to answer clay of the potters, clay of the stove makers, clay of the brick makers, wouldn't that be absurd of us? Well, perhaps it would. Absurd to begin with, I suppose, to imagine that the person who asked the question would understand anything from our answer when we say clay, whether we add that it is doll makers clay or any other craftsman's. Or do you think that anyone can understand the name of a thing when he doesn't know what the thing is? No, certainly not. And so a man who does not know what knowledge is will not understand knowledge of shoes either. No, he won't. Then a man who is ignorant of what knowledge is will not understand what cobbling is or any other craft. That is so. Okay, so now there's a further objection, which is that not only is the answer given here not really an answer to the question that was asked, the information that's being given here doesn't actually help us answer the question that was asked. Now, starting um, with Wittgenstein explicitly and people that were influenced by Wittgenstein, there's a line of criticism of the way that Socrates approaches these questions of definition. And famously, uh, Wittgenstein, who, by the way, was extraordinarily influenced by this dialogue. I think you can read so many things in Wittgenstein's work that are direct attempts to engage with the Theotetus. In his uh, unpublished notes, they've been published now, Wittgenstein objects here that Socrates doesn't even seem to take it as a preliminary answer to the question, what is knowledge, to be given a list of examples. Okay. And Wittgenstein, of course, will develop in his later career a theory where you can use a word like knowledge of a number of things, even though there's no one thing that all of the examples you're looking at have in common. I want to address the criticism here that Plato is rejecting out of hand a list of examples as a definition of knowledge and that he's doing it, and he doesn't have reason to be doing it, that this constitutes a kind of fallacy on his part. I think that this is just wrong. Okay, so I absolutely adore Wittgenstein. I think you can learn a great deal from him. I, as someone who used to be quite into that, I, I just think it's, I just think it, it's not right. I, I just think it's wrong. And I think that there's a simple way to see, perhaps, it seems simple to me now, why what Socrates is trying to say here is actually the correct thing to say. 
So someone influenced by Wittgenstein, and many people have, have made this criticism, okay, want to say, look, uh, sometimes the best you can do for a definition, or at least something that gets you very close to the definition, is just to have a list. Maybe all there is, this is late Wittgenstein speaking, to knowing what knowledge is, is knowing how to use the word correctly. And knowing how to use the word correctly is something more comparable, to use an example I talked about earlier, to knowing whether a guitar is properly tuned than it is to having some definite rule that you apply. Okay? Explicitly. So Wittgenstein might want to suggest that actually, to use a term like knowledge, you don't need to have a definition, and in fact, you can't. You just need to recognize the examples and know how to use the word when those examples are around. If you've read Wittgenstein, he talks about people bringing slabs of concrete to each other on a building site. They understand the word slab when they're able, when they hear the word slab, to go and get one of those and bring it to the building site. Okay, so... There's a line of thought that comes from Wittgenstein that still, um, I think, is is around and persuasive. And it is, it is, I think, if you're going to do philosophy outside of Plato and Kant, Wittgenstein is is an important thinker by any stretch, probably the most important. Um, I don't want to say that, but one of the most important of the 20th century. Um, and so this isn't meant to be uh, hostile, but... Here's what I want to say. Um, you look at the list that was given, geometry, cobbling, astronomy, music, arithmetic, carpentry. Now imagine someone wants to say that what you know, when you know what knowledge is, is exhausted, and this is a strong claim, is exhausted by knowing what the things on that list are and knowing that when those things are around, you can say knowledge. Socrates seems to me to be on very strong ground in rejecting that because those things that are listed are also things of which you can have ignorance. So yes, you can have knowledge of carpentry, you can have knowledge of cobbling, but that list that we have seen can also be a list of things about which you can be ignorant. I think the point here is that that list cannot tell you what knowledge is. If all you know is that list, you don't know what knowledge is. Because those things can also be objects of ignorance. And so knowing that knowledge is about those things doesn't sufficiently distinguish between what knowledge is and ignorance is. You can also have lots of other attitudes that fall short of knowledge or ignorance that are not the same as knowledge, right? You could have beliefs about these subject matters. You could be learning about these subject matters. That's not yet to have knowledge. You could have imaginative ideas of what these subject matters are like. You can have speculations about what goes on in these disciplines. There are lots of cognitive attitudes or cognitive states you can be in with respect to the list that was just given that are not knowledge. Therefore, when we correctly use the word knowledge and apply it to those things, there has to be something else other than the list that we have in our minds that enables us to do that. Okay. Now, this idea that the list might be sufficient is a very strong formulation of the line of thought I'm associating with Wittgenstein and Gilbert Ryle and Peter Geech and a lot of so-called ordinary language philosophers who were critical of the line of reasoning here. In fact, Geech calls this the Socratic fallacy. It's a fallacy for him because he thinks that Socrates is saying here something particularly strong which is that we can't have any useful insight into whether of the items on our list of examples actually are examples of knowledge unless we first know what knowledge is. Okay. 
Now, if that's what Socrates is really pushing here, it is deservedly called a fallacy, if only because it's not quite a fallacy, but it's certainly something that you would want to avoid as a theory, because it puts you in a epistemic position, an epistemic position that's impossible, right? If you can't know, or if you can't, sorry, not know, if you can't be aware in any useful way of whether items on a list are cases of knowledge or not, or can be subjects of knowledge, they're not cases of knowledge yet, right, because they can equally well be cases of ignorance, then you can't really formulate a definition in one of the ways that you might think that you could, right? So essentially what Geech says is that Socrates sets out some constraints on how you can have useful information on things, which make it the case that induction is impossible as a method of establishing definitions. And so if, if you can't look at a list and understand that the items on that list are correctly associated with the term knowledge, you have no hope of ever getting to a definition. Because one of the things you would want to do to get to your definition is try to find a definition that fits your examples. Right? And if you can't have any useful insight into whether those are the right examples to be looking at, you have no way to get started. Okay? So that's the so-called Socratic fallacy. I don't think, and I'm certainly not alone in not thinking this, that Socrates is actually committing it here because he isn't saying that that list is useless. He's not saying that there's no useful insight we can get. And this is what Wittgenstein seems to accuse Socrates here of as well. With great respect, Socrates is accused of it by Wittgenstein. Um, this isn't even a preliminary answer. Really? Is that sad? I don't think so, Wittgenstein. I don't think so. Um, so, there's a question here about how stringent we take the principle to be. And if we hold too strong a version of what Socrates is pushing towards here, we're going to get something that, even if not a fallacy, puts us in a situation that we hope is not our actual situation. And so there's a fallacy of going to this really strong view that makes certain kinds of learning impossible, inductive learning or inductive definition formulation. It's not a fallacy, but it's a fallacy insofar as you probably shouldn't go to the most strong, stringent, also counterintuitively prohibitive um, principle on your first, uh, as your first resort when faced with an issue like this. There's no fallacy if Socrates here is simply saying that you can't have knowledge of a concept until you have a definition. And you can't know for sure how the items on the list you have are relevant to the concept you are trying to define. You can't know it until you have your definition. I think that is true, okay? And again, I think that if you imagine or just observe that it's possible for any list of things that you could have knowledge of, it's possible to be ignorant of those same things. I think that is the point. The point is not that the list is going to be useless to you. Of course it isn't. And the way Plato operates in the dialogues and the way that Socrates operates in the dialogue shows that these kinds of examples are very important. But the examples don't do for you the work that you need to do in order to get the definition. And until you actually have the definition, although you can be aware that the list has something to show you about knowledge, you don't know exactly what it's trying to show you. Okay, because I could show you the list of things that you can have knowledge of, and you can say, aha, I get it. Maybe 
you think that I mean by knowledge ignorance. And now you've looked at the list, you think you've got my point, but you've actually got the exact opposite lesson from what I have shown you. Okay? You now take this list to be useful information that bears on the question, what is ignorance? That was not at all how I intended my list to be taken. You are wrong. Okay? Why are you wrong? You're wrong because there is something that knowledge is that you aren't getting. Okay? The list is not going to tell you that. Um, so anyway, we have this discussion of what's wrong with the list. The addition of clay of the potters, clay of the stove makers, clay of the brick makers, you're just adding information, right? That's irrelevant. If someone doesn't know what clay is, they're not going to need this extra information. It's not going to be so helpful to them. Of course, if they know a list, if they know what these positions in society are, potters, stove makers, brick makers, they might be able to get from the list you've given them they might be able to have the cognitive insight, the leap that happens when we grasp something. They might say, oh, I know what potters are. I know what stove makers are. I know what brick makers are. Oh, yeah, that's the stuff that they all use to make their bricks from, their stoves from, their pots from. Right? This information can be very useful to you in seeing the point that you're supposed to be seeing. Okay? But it can also be misleading. Maybe when you hear these words, you recognize that all of these individuals use water. And maybe you think clay means water. Right? So when you get a list like this, it's always possible to get the wrong message. Now, this is very much something that Wittgenstein would tell you to. It's just that Plato is committed, and Socrates is committed, to providing an answer to the question, what is it to get the wrong message or the right message that goes through the assumption that there's a common form in all the cases where we use the same term correctly. That is the assumption that Wittgenstein and his acolytes, I don't know what else to call them, um, that is the kind of thing that they are interested in. Just to give you a brief uh, sort of picture of what the sort of um, alternative to the picture that Plato is strongly espousing here looks like. Wittgenstein has an idea of what he calls family resemblance, which is a way to explain how it is that you can correctly use one term to apply to several items, how you can come to have that expertise, even though, and this is the important part, the several items on your list to which that term is correctly applied don't have one thing in common. Okay? So to understand Plato, it can be helpful to understand someone who thinks the opposite and who is very intelligent and brings that opposite to its most developed formulation. Okay? Wittgenstein's idea of family resemblance starts from an observation. There can be individuals in a family. So let's imagine we have a family with 20 people in it, okay? It is possible for you to recognize that this person here and this person here are members of the same family, to be correct about that, and to correctly, you know, use the same last name, say. This is a cook and this is a cook even though the two members to which we're correctly applying the term share no common features, okay? So it's possible to look at a family of 20 people and say of two members, oh, they're members of the same family, even though the two members that you're looking at don't have anything in common. Well, how is that possible? Well, it's possible if you know the whole family or enough of the family and that the type of resemblance there is in a family 
isn't one that requires all the members to share any one particular feature, but rather gets established by means of some kind of chain of features that might be shared by a few members, and then some other chain of features that overlaps with our initial chain that links those initial members, the second group links the second group to some third group of members. So what I mean is, so I have this nose that I think you can call a snub nose, like Socrates. You might, if you know my family, recognize a cousin of mine as my cousin. Maybe they don't have any physical feature. So how do you know that they're a member of my family? Well, if you see that I have this snub nose, and then you see my brother, and you see that he has it, you can say, aha, well, those two are members of the same family. But then you see my brother has a certain type of eyes that aren't the same as mine. He shares those eyes with this other family member. Okay, so now this other family member is tied to my brother by means of sharing the same eyes. This family member doesn't have the snub nose. They have the eyes. So now we have me, snub nose, my brother, snub nose, and different eyes from me. Third person, same eyes as my brother, lacking the snub nose. You can say that I am in the same family member as the third person, even though we share no features in common, because there's this overlapping link. Me and individual three don't have any features in common, but I have a feature in common with my brother, and my brother has a distinct feature in common with the third party. You can say that we're all part of the same family. Hence, family resemblance is a case where we're able to recognize that a certain term correctly unites a number of distinct individuals, even though there is no one common feature. Okay, This is what the alternative to what Plato is suggesting needs to be happening when we use the same term. This is what that looks like. Okay. To give the example that Wittgenstein gives, uh, a real-world example that's not about family resemblance, it's arguable that something like the term game functions in this way. Okay. So think about this list of family members where some of them have things in common with others and others have other things in common with others and that somehow they're all linked. Think about the way we use the word game. Now, there are some definitions of game that we might try that turn out on consideration not to apply to certain other things that we consider to be games, right? So you might think every game requires competition between more than one person. Well, is solitaire not a game, therefore? No, solitaire is a game. You might think that a game requires the possibility of strategy. There are games that don't. Children's games don't often require, you know, you can't become an expert um, at certain children's games. For any feature you pick as an identifying feature of a game, as the thing that defines game, the suggestion here is that you're going to find a game that doesn't have that feature, but that we still recognize as a game. And the suggestion here is that that is possible. It's possible for us to correctly use the word game of a set of examples and to learn how to do it without grasping one common form or feature because game one has certain features in common with game two and game three has a distinct set of features in common with game two. Therefore, game one and game three, even though they share no common features, recognizably belong to the same class when we understand that the second member is also considered to be a game. Okay. So, you know, game one might be solitaire. Game two might be poker. Game three might be chess. Okay, poker has the competitive element between more people. It shares cards and strategy with the first solitaire game. Game three, chess, has the competitive element, doesn't involve cards, still has strategy. Okay, Maybe 
You can get sports in there in some other way, okay? Maybe you can get children's games like, you know, the telephone game where one person says one thing uh, to somebody else and the child at the end has a totally different message.